The Fletcher Seventh-day Adventist Church is a Christian people who believe Jesus is the Son of God, the hope of the world, who died on the cross to redeem us all for eternal life with God. Our purpose is to lift Jesus up and love people in. Visit our website at www.fletchersda.org. And now be blessed by the Holy Spirit as you listen to a Bible message. Today's scripture reading is found in the book of Hosea, chapter 11, verses 1 through 8. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed to the Baals and burned incense to carved images. I taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I drew them with gentle cords and bands of love, and I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped and fed them. He shall not return to the land of Egypt, but the Assyrian shall be his king, because they refuse to repent, and the sword shall slash in his cities, devour his districts, and consume them because of their own counsels. My people are bent on backsliding from me. Though they called to the Most High, none at all exalt him. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I set you like Zeboam? My heart churns within me. My sympathy is stirred. Do you pray with me? God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. God, you who are the rock that we stand on and the redeemer who rescues us when we've fallen off that safe place. God, speak in this place. Let your words be heard. Let our hearts be drawn to you because of your great love for us. We love you, Jesus, because of your love for us. And we ask this all in your name. Amen. So we've started a new series here at Fletcher uh, looking at some of the last kings in the kingdoms of Israel, in the, or the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of uh, Judea. And uh, it's called The Last Kings. And what we're, what we're hoping to do is look at some of these lesser known kings that, that were ruling at the time when basically the, the end came, right? These kingdoms that God had established, that God loved, that God had such great plans for, that the prophets worked with, that the kings led, that the judges worked with, finally came to these sad endings. Israel first and then Judea later. And so as, as we look at some of these stories, what we're hoping for is that you will not just maybe learn some history you haven't known before. That's going to happen. I mean, I've read the Bible through myself uh, multiple times and, and, and looking at some of these stories, I'm like, who's that again? I didn't even know these guys' names, some of them, because the stories are so short and you're reading it, you just read right past them. You read the guy's name once or twice in the Bible, you don't remember that, right? So we hope that you will uh, maybe learn some history from the Bible that you might not have known before, might not have read, might have rushed over in reading onto something more interesting, understandably. Um, but more importantly, that you'll learn something that'll affect your life now, right? That these stories are not just about ancient peoples. They're about ancient peoples, but they're more about a God that still is present and active right now and the way that he works with people, the way that he struggles to bring redemption and healing to people who so often don't even want it. And so as, as we come into this sermon series, we're kind of coming in with this term that's used in film called in medias res, it means in the middle, right? If you've ever watched a movie or read a story where the story starts at the beginning of the book, but the story that the book is talking about doesn't necessarily start at the beginning of the book. Does that make sense? So it comes in with a guy running down a country road, running from something, and you're not sure what it is, right? You're in the middle of the story, and part of the adventure is figuring out what's even happening. And this sermon series does that. We both come in on the last three kings. Pastor James is preaching the last three kings of Judea. I'm preaching the last three of Israel. And so um, he preached the first one last week. I'm preaching the first one from Israel this week. And so we come in to the story, not only in the middle, but near the end of it, right? Like as people that are alive after the fact, we know how the story ends. It ends tragically. Israel's dispersed. It's destroyed. The cities are torn down. It's replaced by people from other kingdoms but we're not there yet. And the people in these stories 
weren't there yet. And the one we're looking at today, his name is Pekiah. If you want to open up to, if I can find where my, which one I used here, here it is. Okay, 2 Kings uh, chapter 15, verse 23. I'll give you a, a second to find that there if you'd like to. If not, you can just listen along. But 2 Kings 15 tells the story of this king, the third to last king. He didn't know it, but there were only two more kings to come after him, and then Israel was done forever. That was it. This guy, Pekiah, comes along. 2 Kings 15, 23 says this. Well, here's some pages rustling. I'll give you another second. Here we are. 23. It says, In the 15th year of Azariah, king of Judea, Pekiah, son of Menahem, became king of Israel and Samaria. And he reigned a grand total of two years. Real long kingdom there, right? It says this about him. Pekiah did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to, to commit. Then one of his chief officers, Pekah, son of Ramallah, conspired against him, taking 50 men to Gilead with him. He assassinated Pekiah along with Argob and Ariah. Great names for children if you want those. In the citadel of the royal palace at Samaria, um, Argob is wonderful. So Pekiah killed, so Pekah killed Pekiah and succeeded him as king. That's it. I mean, that's the story of Pekiah, right? You can look all over through scriptures and there's like, there's not like some other real big hidden story about him or some amazing thing he did. Like that's his story. He comes to power. He follows his, his father. His father was king before him. He's anointed king. He serves two years. Some other dude doesn't like him, comes along and kills him in the citadel. So where he should be the safest, kills him and two of his homies who had very, very beautiful names and succeeded him as king. That's it. That's the story, right? And then it goes on to the next king, which we'll talk about next week. And then the final king we'll talk a few weeks later. And that's the, that's the story. In the reality of Israel, this is just another meaningless king, another worthless king that comes along that rules for two years. He doesn't accomplish anything of substance, and he's succeeded by somebody else who we'll find out doesn't really do a whole lot more. Like, that's it. And so we kind of zoom out a little bit to like look at the kingdom that he rules. It's this kingdom of Israel. It's the, the 10 northern tribes. The only two that stayed loyal after King Solomon died were down south called Judah. But this guy's ruling 10 of the tribes. So this should be the bulk of Israel. This is like the major portion of Israel. This should be the bigger kingdom. And yet they're struggling like over and over and over, like as they try to get on their feet politically and socially and economically, things kind of fall apart. Like if you picture Israel, there's Israel in the middle, right below them is Judah, so that's their southern boundary is Judah, this other kingdom, which tends to be more powerful than they are, even though it's smaller than them. North of them, you've got the Assyrians and the Aramites for a while, the Arameans, not the Aramites, the Arameans, and then the Assyrians, which kind of like in engulf that. And then south of them, you have Egypt. So you've got like this tiny kingdom with its like big brother downstairs. It's a little bit more powerful than him. But then on the so both sides of both of you are the two major dominant kingdoms in the world at that point. You've got Assyria and you've got Egypt. And so you're kind of like battling back and forth. They both want this land. And so at different times, they kind of fight through there to fight each other and everything. But they're basically trying to figure out how to survive. And so what Israel's done at this point, they've decided that if they link up with Assyria, that's probably the best bet because they seem more powerful than Egypt. And so you get into all this political posturing where they're paying off Assyria to let them actually function as a semi-autonomous kingdom. They get to rule and do their thing, but they pay a massive tribute to this kingdom of Assyria in hopes that if the Egyptians come along, that the Assyrians will protect them, or if Judah comes along, they'll protect them from their big brother, Judah. And it's just this jumbled up mess of politics. They're not a powerful kingdom. They have no influence in the world around them any more than whoever they pay off more, right? If they can pay more money to this guy, who maybe will help them. But they don't really have anything to offer. That's the kingdom. And so this meaningless king inherits what to all outside perspectives would be an almost meaningless kingdom. And that's the story. So how did we get here, right? Like this kingdom that had been so powerful and blessed by God and given to prophets, miraculous rescuing, how did they get to that state, this meaningless, 
empty state where when they cease to exist about 10 or 15 years later after this guy, it's like a blip on the radar. It doesn't matter. The nations around them aren't affected by them existing or being taken over. It doesn't matter. How did we get there? And we get this hint in this short story of Pekiah as it says nothing he did except for one thing. It says he did what in the eyes of the Lord? He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And it says by doing one thing in particular, he says he continued the sins of who? Do you remember? Do you have your Bibles open still? Jeroboam. And I must confess, I have a really hard time keeping track of the kings of Israel, let alone remembering who they even are. So as I was studying this, I'm like, where was Jeroboam in the order? I don't even remember, right? So I read back to the, the guy before this dude, and it says the same thing, did evil in the eyes of the Lord, followed the sins of Jeroboam. So it's not right before him. Next guy back, evil in the eyes of the Lord, followed in the sins of Jeroboam. Back farther, right? I went back and back and back till I ran into this guy named Jeroboam, and you know where he is? Any of you who are better Bible scholars than me, you know where Jeroboam is in the order of the kings of Israel. He's the first one like all the way back to the beginning, over and over and over, every single king of Israel is defined by the fact that they did evil in the eyes of the Lord because they followed the sins of Jeroboam. That's it. How did they get there? Like this is uh, an endemic problem. This is like a systemic problem with the state of the northern tribes of Israel at that point. The interesting thing though is this is that there are two kings that actually were pretty good in Israel's history. In, in Judah, they had some more kings. They had a, little, a few more like, decent kings. They were kind of scattered here and there. Israel, they're like all bad. But there's this little blip on the radar again where there are these, there's these two kings. And the first one's name is uh, Joram. And Joram is a fascinating character. If you want to read about some of these, these guys today, I'd encourage you to do that. There's a, there's a little bit written about more about these gentlemen than there is about uh, Pekiah, the guy that we're talking about today. So Joram was the first decent king of Israel. He came along. Um, his brother ruled the kingdom. He never expected to rule. Um, his brother dies, and he's, he's left because his brother has no children. It's him. He's like, I guess I get to be king. The interesting thing is who his parents were. He came from royalty, and that was helpful, but his, his dad was a dude named Ahab, and his mom was a lady named Jezebel. So not like, uh, uh, like hopeful for Israel. They're like, oh, great, another great king. But here's the interesting thing. He was a decent king. It says he did this. It says that he ripped down the Asherah poles, the, the poles, these poles that they were used to worship Baal and Asherah. And it seems that that was probably some major thing that, that, that Ahab had set up, like probably in Samaria. They don't know for sure, but the, 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 the preponderance in the story that's given to that seems like that was a big deal. So it's probably there in the capital city, this big pole that's used as a center of worship for Baal. He rips the thing down. I mean, this is a big deal. Not only is he going against the religion that's popular at that time, he's rejecting the tradition of his family against nature, against nurture. This guy's a hero in many ways. Like he fights against Baal, destroys the religion of Baal for the most part, doesn't worship Baal himself. Super, super interesting guy. Um, but in that, it says, even though he knocked down all the stuff of Baal, it says, but still, he followed in the sins of Jeroboam. I was like, wait, so the sin of Jeroboam wasn't Baal worship? That's confusing. Because the people of Israel were like super committed to following Baal. They were like this protean, temperamental, like ever changeable group of people. And yet the one thing they were committed to was like not following God, which the verse that was read today says that. It says, my people are like committed to not following me, right? We talked this, about this in um, young adult Sabbath school today. We're like, some people train for like marathons and the Olympics. These people train to like not follow God, however you do that, Right? And yet, this guy fights against that, and he won't worship Baal. But yet, he's following the sins of Jeroboam. Kind of confusing. Also, this guy was like the sometimes friend of Elisha. All of these interesting stories that happened in, in Elisha's ministry, almost all of them happened in conjunction with this King Joram. When it talks about the king did this or the king said that, it's Joram. This guy ruled for a while. So he's not following Baal. He's kind of off and on friends with the king of Israel, or with, with the prophet of Israel, Elisha. At one point, um, the, the whole country is under attack, and Elisha keeps feeding information to, to Joram, right? So the Arameans are like, all right, we're going to sneak over and do this little sneak attack. And Elisha like, sends a letter, they're going to be sneaky and do this. And so uh, 
uh, Joram is able to get out of this trap. And finally, in exasperation, the king of the Arameans yells at his like, inner circle and says, which one of you is the traitor, right? I'm sure a lot of you have heard this story. It's like, which one of you is the traitor? Because someone's telling him what's going on here. There's no other way he knows, right? This is too tricky. And one of the guys speaks up. Somehow he knows about Elisha. He's like, no, it's not, the, it's not us. This prophet Elisha like, tells the king what you say in your own bedchamber, right? He's reading your private messages on Facebook, so be, be embarrassed. And he's like, all right, I'm going to go get this guy then. So he sends his army to get Elisha. They surround the city, right? Elisha's servant's like, oh, no, we're going to die. And he's like, no, open his eyes, God. And God opens his friend's eyes, and there's all these like flaming chariots on the hillside protecting Elisha, right? This beautiful story. And the story flips, and God says, or Elisha says, close their eyes, the people that are surrounding the city, his enemies, God blinds them. Elisha goes out and like straight up lies to them, which I find hilarious. He's like, this isn't the right city. And they're like, what? He's like, yeah, I'll tell you where it is. I'll take you. Like, okay, thanks, helpful man. And he takes them to the capital city of Israel, Samaria, and takes this army. It wasn't probably the whole army, but it was a large group that the king had sent. Takes them into the city. They lock the gates. And he's like, okay, I've got a really, something real nice for you. Open their eyes, God. And their eyes are open, and they're inside the enemy city, right? And they're like, oh, this doesn't end well. That's Elisha. That's Joram, right? So you've got this whole story, this whole connection. That happens. Elisha is the one that's outside the city, or the city is surrounded again. There's this huge plague, and all the people are dying. Some of you heard the story. There's these four lepers in Samaria. They go out to the camp, and they think, well, at least we're, you know, we're risking that military killing us, but maybe they'll give us like our last meal before we die, so that's better than sitting here and dying without our last meal. So they go out there, and there's no one in the camp. God had chased them off. They eat. They go back into the city, tell everyone, right, this whole story. That's Elisha. That's Joram, right? So this guy is trying to follow God. He threatens to kill Elisha sometimes, so he doesn't have it quite right. He's mad at Elisha, but they got a bit of a you know, tempestuous relationship, but they're, they're friends. They get along. That's him. And yet, even though he's working with the prophet, and at least trying to listen to the prophet a lot of the time, he's not following Baal, yet there's Joram. He's committing the sin of Jeroboam. And so God brings along another king to take his place, a dude named Jehu, which is another great name for a child if you're looking for child names. I'm thinking of child names because we're having a baby, so bear with me. What was that Agog or whatever his name was? Argog? I want to find that again. Argob. That's my number one so far. <laughs> so good. So God is done with Joram. He's like, listen, this guy still won't quit committing the sin of Jeroboam, right? He, he goes to Elisha and says, I want a new king. His name is Jehu. Send your dude to like, uh, put some oil on his head. And it's almost kind of humorous. Elisha tells one of his prophet friends, he's like, go and find uh, Jehu, who's a general in the army of Joram, and take him into a private room. Tell him you're going to be king. Anoint him with oil and then run. That's his command. <laughs> Like, reach out, and I'm gone. Like, just get out of there. So he does that. That's how the story happens. He anoints him with oil, just bolts running. And so Jehu comes out of this private chamber with this prophet guy that's just bolted, like this scared cat. And he's surrounded by his officers. And they're like, so what did that guy say to you? And he's like, ah, you know, they're all crazy. You know, they all say the same things. And his guys are like, hmm, seems like there's more to it. He's like, well, there's a little more. He said, I'm going to be king. And they all like drop down on the floor, throw their stuff down. They're like, we're, we're, we'll follow you. Don't kill us. Don't kill us. We'll follow you. And he's like, cool. All right. Well, then let's get this going. And he hops in his chariot and he rides toward the capital city where this guy named Joram is recuperating after being wounded in battle. And he's up on like in his palace and one of his guards comes to him and says, hey, I see a chariot coming towards the city with some people you want to send out a messenger to find out who this is? And he's like, yeah, yeah, send him out. So the messenger rides out, and as he gets close, he realizes it's Jehu. He recognizes him. They're both military guys. Like, hey, Jehu, what's going on? Do you come in peace? And Jehu's like this like, epic warrior. He's like, why do you speak to me of peace? Fall in line behind me. And the guy's like, fair enough. <laughs> behind in line, riding towards the city. So the, the guard on the city wall is like, oh, that's bad. <laughs> so he goes back inside. Uh, king, so that guy didn't come back. He stayed with whoever it is. Like, send another one. Another guy goes out, rides up. Hey, Jehu, are, do you come in peace? Same answer. 
Why do you come to me, or why do you come to me to talk about peace? Fall in line behind me. Like, okay, in line behind him, guard upon the wall. Oh, that's, that's really bad. <laughs> so at this point, Joram is concerned. Something's up. He hops in his chariot with the king of Judea, who's actually there with him at that point. That's his nephew. They're friends at that point. These two countries are getting along, all right? He rides out to meet Jehu. As he gets close, he asks him, do you come in peace? And Jehu gives this, again, epic answer. He says, how can there be peace when the land is full of the idolatry of your wicked mother and the blood that's on your family's hands? He's like, oh no, I'm gonna turn around. So he turns around to like try to race off. And as he's like riding away, like Joram shoots him down. It says like a dog, just like shoots him down like some old West scene with his bow and arrow boom, through his back, kills the king in front of everybody. And everyone's kind of like, just kind of stops. And it says, he walks over to the chariot. It pulls this guy out. It's a, it's a gruesome story. It says, he throws his body into this field that's right there. You know what this field is? It says, it's the field of Naboth, a man that this man's mother had cheated out of his land. His father had murdered him and his family to get this land. It's Shakespearean. This whole thing, this story just like wraps up. He's killed on this land. He bleeds out on the land that was bought with the blood of treachery from his family. But that's not it. He shoots the king of uh, Judea just for good measure. <laughs> he rides off, ah, doesn't die then, dies you know, a little bit later. So he's killed two kings, rides into the city, and Jezebel's still alive. She must have been younger than Ahab. She's still kicking along there. She's old at that point. She hears he's coming. It says she kind of gets dressed up to meet him. She looks out her window as he rides in, Jehu rides in. She yells down, hey, have you come, what have you come to see me for, you traitor? And he doesn't even talk to her. He yells up, he's like, who up there is with me? And it says that some of her close allies, some of the eunuchs, these men that take, took care of her, it says they're like, uh, they saw the sea change. They're like, mm, we want to try and be on the new team that wins here. It's so like, how about we toss her down to you? And so they did that. Did not end well for Jezebel. It says then he goes inside and has a little party like you do after you've murdered a whole family. It's gruesome. Old Testament is very gruesome. And then he sends letters throughout the kingdom to the guys that are taking care of the 70 sons of the family of Ahab and has them all executed. All of these people do that as well because they see how the country has changed. It's this political tumult. They have them all executed. And so he's eradicated like this whole family of, of people that God has put this judgment on have done such terrible things in Israel for so long. It's just God's like, okay, I'm done. And he uses Jehu. But then Jehu does something even more like, it's tricky. He puts out this proclamation, proclamation in Israel and he says, okay, here's the deal. Uh, Ahab served uh, Baal a little bit. Jehu's gonna serve Baal a lot. So come on in, we're gonna do a big Baal party and get this thing rolling. And so all the people show up, like hundreds and hundreds of priests of Baal, people that work in this religion of Baal, all of them cram into this big temple of Baal there in the city. And they're in there, and it's kind of like humming with the tension. The king threatens them, says, if you don't come, I'm going to kill you. But that's normal. Kings always threaten that. They're not, they don't, it doesn't seem shady yet. They're like, cool, no, no, we're on your side. We're, we're team Baal all the way. And they're crammed into this temple so full that no one else can get in. And he makes uh, uh, an announcement. He says, okay, I want to make sure there's no prophets of Yahweh in here. Those losers, right? I don't want them to be part of this. Any of you guys look around. You know anyone that's a traitor trying to sneak in with us, the real people? Throw them out. They look around like, no, no, it's just prophets of Baal. It's just people of Baal. Cool, okay. He's like, just a second, I'll be right back. He goes outside. He's like, hold that thought. And he says, he says he has 80 guards or so, and he tells them, if you let anyone get out, it's your life for theirs. And they're like, okay, we see where this is going. And again, in this Shakespearean twist, he gets back up front and he says, you know, actually, I'm really not a big fan of Baal. He's kind of a ding-dong. So tip of the hat, I'll see you guys later. And it says he has the entire group destroyed. No one can escape. He rips down the temple and it says to like add insult to injury for the Baal worshipers, he turns that temple into a latrine. So the public bathrooms are now on your old temple of Baal, like the end, right? It's this epic story that if it was made into a movie, we would be like, well, don't watch that one. It's really violent and terrible. It's like, that might be true, but that's what the Bible says. That's the story of Joram and Jehu, the only two decent kings of Israel. And especially with the story of Jehu, it feels like that he would get the appellation at the end to say like he actually followed God, right? Doesn't it seem like he did? He enacted the judgments of God. He eradicated the religion of Baal. It says, but yet 
even Jehu followed in the sins of Jeroboam. So I kept reading back further and further until I finally got to 2 Kings 12. I think it is. Got the wrong page there. There it is. Second Kings, or sorry, First Kings. First Kings 12, 26. If you'd turn there, I want to look at what is the sin of Jeroboam? The only thing that defines Pekiah's kingship the last two years. And then it's over. That's defined every single king before him, even kings that destroy the religion of Baal, even people that resisted their family's tradition of Baal worship and evil, that tried to force themselves out of it to get away from that gravity, still couldn't escape the gravity of this sin that was embedded in the DNA of Israel. So the story goes like this. uh, Solomon's a good king of Israel, but he's a little rough on the northern tribes. When he dies, his son... uh, his son, uh, Rehoboam, becomes king. And Rehoboam is a young king, and he's not sure what to do. He's figuring things out. And these representatives from the northern tribes of Israel come, and they say, listen, your father taxed us super heavily, and we're not sure why, because we're all on the same team here, right? So you being new and trying to start things fresh, you know, making Israel great again, you know, why don't you lower our taxes? How's that? And Jeroboam's like, or Rehoboam's like, I don't know. And it says he goes to his friends. He doesn't go to the old people, right? The people that had actually worked in the system there that had worked with his father. They all said, that's good, do that. You'll actually win them over. They'll be super loyal to you. Like, let up. There's no reason to get all these taxes for them. Them let it up a little bit. But it says he goes to his younger friends. It says literally the, the men he grew up with. These are the idiots he grew up with, right? And he's like, what do you think? And they're like, oh, tell them that they're stupid, Tell him that we're going to tax him even more. And he uses this like phrase. They say, tell him, my, my little finger is bigger than my father's loins, which I'll let you figure out what he's talking about with his father, not talking about his clothing. He's super graphic, and it sounds like a young man talking to his other young, dumb friends. What should I say to them? He says that, and I will torture you with scorpions if you try to get me to like let up on the taxes again. The end. Ha ha, now I'm in charge. And then they all revolt and leave him and he like destroys the king of Israel. It's like, wah, wah, that didn't go well. So the whole country separates over this idiot, this guy Rehoboam, and Jeroboam becomes the king of the northern tribes. They elect him. He doesn't force himself in. God actually calls him to be king. And it says this, as he's ruling and figuring things out, it says in 1 Kings 12, it says Jeroboam uh, fortified Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, lived there. From there he went out and built Peniel. And then in verse 26, Jeroboam thought to himself, the kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they will again give their allegiance to the Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. They will kill me and return to the king Rehoboam. So this guy's kind of sussing out the situation. He's like, okay, I've got most of the people, but what do I not have? What does he not have? The temple. Like the thing that Israel revolves around. It's more powerful than any king is the temple religion of Yahweh. And he doesn't have it. And he knows he doesn't have it. Who has it? The other guy. And he's like, if people start going down there to worship... They're going to Jerusalem all the time. That's going to strengthen their bonds with that kingdom. They're, they're going to become less salty over time. That king was a ding-dong, but I mean, they're not going to remain angry at him forever. Maybe his son will come next and be okay. Like, I don't know. But what's going to happen? He sees down the road. What's going to happen is if people keep going down to Jerusalem to worship, I'm going to lose my what? I'm going to lose my kingdom. If they go and worship the Lord, that's going to lead them to become loyal to the king of Judah again and I'm going to lose my kingdom. So he decides to do something. Verse 28, after seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. Seen this before. He said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. That sounds familiar again, doesn't it? So like ring some bells. It's like literally quoting Aaron. One he set up in Bethel, the other in Dan. And the people, or, and this thing became a sin to the people, went even as far as Dan to worship 
the one built there. So at the very beginning of Israel, at the outset, you've got a king, and he's afraid. We can understand that feeling, can't we? Like, we've all been afraid, afraid that we're going to lose something, afraid that we're not going to get what we want, get what we deserve, and it might even be good for the people around us. They don't need to go back to this terrible king, right? I'm afraid that this thing is going to happen. Ultimately, it's tied to the religion of Yahweh. He is afraid at the end of the day, he is afraid that the religion of Yahweh is going to cost him what he loves most because he loves something more than religion of Yahweh, doesn't he? He is afraid that the religion of Yahweh is going to cost him his kingdom. And he seeks to remedy that. He basically sets up a personalized religion. Archaeologists have like argued how much this thing was like distant from the religion of Yahweh. It seems like it was pretty close. It seems like the system was set up relatively similar, the kind of like sacrifices, different things. But the difference was, is there was a golden calf at a city in the south, a golden calf at a city in the north. It made it like super accessible for the people. He's like, hey, just go to the local one, worship this thing. He sets up a personalized religion ultimately to strengthen his own kingdom. He replaced Yahweh as the foundation of the people. He says, these are the, these are the gods that brought you out of Israel, or out of Egypt, right? He's like redacting the whole story, just like Aaron did originally. He says like, it wasn't even Yahweh. Don't worry about the God that's down there in Jerusalem. He's fine. He's for the Judeans. We've got a better one. We've got this golden calf that represents a God. I mean, they weren't dumb enough to think that golden calf was going to save them. They know it's just an idol, but they believe there's gods that are connected to those things. And those were the gods that had saved them. Those are the gods that would set them free and make them prosperous. Jeroboam knows that's not true. He's making the whole thing up on the spot. But he knows that it will establish his kingdom. It will keep the people loyal to their nation. It will keep the people loyal to his throne. And at the end of it all, that's all he really cares about, isn't it? And in the end, when we look at the, the, the beginning of the, or the, the, the beginning of the end, as we start up with these last three kings, it's like the beginning of the end. You see things start to fall apart. And as we start looking at the beginning of the end, we start to realize that the end started way back in the beginning, didn't it? That it was built wrong. It was built ineffectively. There's a, a song, there's a phrase from a song I love. It says, I built you a home in my heart with rotten wood that decayed from the start. Ugh. Right? Powerful line. Israel could have sang that to, to each other, like we built a home for ourselves here with rotten wood and it was decayed from the very beginning. That even good kings or decent kings like Joram, who can fault Joram? Like where he started with his family and to where he got to, escaping the gravity of Ahab and Jezebel, he deserves commend, commendation. I don't, I, don't, I don't know, maybe he's gonna be fine, he'll be in heaven, I don't know, God didn't let him keep ruling. But that guy did good things, he was fighting against the prevailing evil of his time and yet he didn't even touch this basic problem, the problem that there were gods in Israel that had displaced the God of Israel, that the foundation was wrong. And king after king after king passed this thing forward until it became so intertwined in the, 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 the nation of Israel that it was just part of who they were. They couldn't remember a time when there weren't these two beautiful sanctuaries at Dan and Bethel. That's who they were, right? It's part of their national heritage at that point. And it's passed forward and forward and forward. And literally no king of Israel ever gets away from the sin of Jeroboam that had destroyed Israel. It just goes on and on. He says, these are the gods. These are the gods that have set you free. These are the gods that will protect you. But isn't that really like all of our downfall? When we get scared... when we're concerned that things aren't gonna work out the way we want. I know like all of the bad decisions I've ever made in my life that I can think of were made because I was not maybe terrified, but scared that things weren't gonna work out the way I wanted, so I go for plan B or C or D, right? I'm like, well, this seems good enough. This seems like a decent decision based on the circumstances because I'm afraid. It's a very human Thing. And when we can look at, it, look at it more compassionately in ourselves, we can see it in these people to see that they're not something separate from us. They are us, right? Joram and Jehu, Pekiah, all of these guys, even Jeroboam, that's us, isn't it? 
that most of us in many areas of our lives have built on very, very rotten foundations, right? We build on greed. We build on ego. We build on pride, selfishness. Like some of the most beautiful things we have, some of our relationships, our careers, even our religion is oftentimes built on a foundation that is not a foundation that will last. And some of you have had situations where you realize that when something falls apart or you're challenged through some situation that makes you realize very clear-eyed that you're not even doing these things for the right reasons. You're going to church for, for, for reasons that are never gonna last, right? I mean, some of the nastiest conversations I've watched online come from Christians when they feel their religion is threatened and they get nasty and vicious because their religion is not something that's transcending them. Their religion is something that, that they're using to prop up their ego. They get to be right. They get to be safe. They get to be whatever, right? And someone challenges that, and there's this venom that comes out because it's a human problem. When we build on the wrong things, we end in places we never imagined we would get. So what have you built on today? When something's challenged in your life, when you get scared of losing something, when those foundations become a little bit shaky, when you look back and you realize, I built on selfishness, right? This might be a good relationship now, but I've built it on selfishness. There's so much of me in this thing that's selfish and me just grasping for what I want. This career is nothing I even wanted to do. I was just greedy at the end of the day. I wanted money. I wanted to prove to my dad I was worthwhile, right? And so I did this thing I don't even love, and that's the foundation. I came into this religion and I was maybe hopeful, but like I realized now I just want to be right. All I want to do is be right so bad, right? And you see these broken foundations that so many of us have built on. And at our, our, our clearest, clear-eyed moments, we can kind of see that a little bit and acknowledge it. Usually we don't even admit it to ourselves. We can't. But we see those. And we realize we've built on something that is very, very just rotten, rotten wood. And it feels like there's no hope. You look at this, this, this nation of Israel and you're like, what hope is there for them? Like, they've, they've built on the wrong thing from the beginning. It's just this selfish nationalism this king had, this selfishness to, like, keep the people to himself, to literally lure them away from God because going to God, he thought, might make them go back to this other king. And they've passed it on over and over. They've worshiped all these terrible things. They've sacrificed their own children for these gods. And they won't even listen. Like, the best king they had halfway listened to Elisha, but still, at the end of the day, wouldn't listen to him that much when it really cut through him or his kingdom. When we built at the wrong beginning, what do we do? When you realize you built on the wrong foundation, what do you do? The good news is, is that there, there is more to the story. There's a prophet named Hosea, verse 11 of his book, if you want to turn there. It was read this morning earlier by Danae. Thank you for reading that. Hosea 11. This is written at the same time, right? So this is written when Israel's going through all of this. They're starting to get close to the end. It's the beginning of the end. Things are falling apart. The kingdoms around them are crushing in on them. This king, Pekiah, is king. And right around that time, Hosea speaks up. And he doesn't just speak for himself. He says he speaks for Yahweh himself, the God who's been rejected for like 200 years, completely ignored he always speaks up, and he says this. He says, when Israel, it's Hosea 11. I think someone asked me who's the, where it was. Hosea 11 says this. This is God talking. It says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. Out of Egypt, I called my son. But the more I called Israel, the further they went from me. They sacrificed to Baals. They burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, it was I who took him by the arms, but they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them along with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. I lifted the yoke from their neck. I bent down to feed them. Will they not return to Egypt and Assyria will rule over them because they've refused to repent? Swords will flash in their cities, will be destroyed, the bars and the gates put an end to their plans. For my, be my people are determined to turn from me. 
Even if they call to the Most High, they don't exalt him. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboim? My heart is changed within me. All of my compassion is aroused. God speaks to these people who not only have started on the wrong, have not only built on the wrong foundation, they've even like redefined their beginning, right? The beginning where God led them out of, out of Egypt. And they've said, no, it's these, these gods did that, right? They've got the wrong beginning and it's gonna lead to their end. And God calls to them and he says, hey, listen, you remember who really led you out of, out of Egypt? You know who it was, it was me. It wasn't these stupid idols. I was the one that led you out. And even more than that, I didn't just set you free from this place. I've been so close and intimately connected with you as you've walked away from me this entire time for hundreds of years. I was as close as if I was holding you by your hands and holding you up. Like this little child learning to walk. He's like, that's how intimately connected with you I am. I am your beginning. I am your sustainer. I am your savior. I carry you all of the way. And even when you want to walk away and I I feel like I might need to let you go out of freedom, like it's your call, I still can't even bring myself to do it. So I'm going to wait and I'm going to wait and I'm going to wait. And ultimately, I'm going to come and shed my blood on this cross to save you even after your kingdom's destroyed. Like I'm going to chase you to the ends of the earth. I will chase you to hell itself and shed my blood to save you because I am your God. The problem for them building on a wrong beginning was to go back. The answer was to go back to the right beginning. And God calls to them and says, I'm your beginning. I'm always your beginning. I'm not just this thing that happened then. I'm a beginning that can happen now. When you find yourself building on greed and selfishness and pride and arrogance, just fear that you're thrashing around trying to find something of safety, God looks with us on, with with compassion. It says that he looks down and he holds us with his hands even as we strain to get away from his grasp. And so the hope and the good news that Israel had and ultimately rejected that we have, and I pray that we won't reject, is to let go of the the broken foundations that we have built on in our relationships, in our careers, in our religion even, and go back to the beginning that will ultimately sustain us, and that is the God who sets us free, the God who holds us up, whose heart is moved with compassion toward us. That when we, we feel fear and we're tempted to act out of selfishness, that we'll say, you know what, I'm not going to serve the gods of selfishness. I'm not going to build on that foundation. I'm going to risk and build on the foundation of God, the God who gives so much. He'd give his own life. Surely he'll take care of me. What if I just wait a little bit longer and don't get selfish or unethical? Just wait. Wait on the Lord because he will renew your strength. Jeroboam was not willing to wait on the Lord and neither was the rest of Israel for hundreds of years. And God finally stopped trying to force them to wait and just kind of let them go as they ran off into destruction. But he was there offering them every day a new beginning. One of my favorite verses in the Bible says his mercies are new every morning. It's not old bread that he's kept around. He offered to you back then and now it's stale because you waited. It's new. He bakes it fresh every day. You reject it every day. The only bread I've had that's close, almost that good, is Ken Knavel's and his delicious bread. I see him <laughs> make sure he's awake. Even his bread doesn't come close to that freshness of the mercy of God that's new every morning. The word that God uses to describe himself is merciful, right? His mercies are new every morning. That word in Hebrew, mercy, is the same root word in Hebrew for the word womb the place of growth, the place of life. That to be merciful towards someone is to be wombful towards them, to give over your system for the nourishment of new life, to sacrifice yourself, your space, your body, your discomfort as your clothes don't fit anymore for the benefit of another. Mercy, wombfulness. When God looks at you, he is wombful towards you like a mother who's given over her body to a new life that changes her diet and everything about her life is changed for this new life. And once that little child is born, that that woman is never the same. That even like the spouse is probably knocked down a notch or two, right? That's how it goes. Like that child is everything. 
Like God even likens himself to a mother. He's like, you know how mothers love their children? And he's like, well, sometimes they don't. But he's like, they love their children so good that I can almost say that that's, almost, that's close to me, he says. I am wombful towards you. I would give everything for you. And so wherever you find yourself this morning, or now a few minutes into afternoon, we'll stop for lunch. You might have built on something faulty. You've got things in your life, in your story, that are just like written into your DNA of selfishness and brokenness and terrible decisions you've made and I've made. The first step is to seeing it's there, right? That's helpful, but so many of us stop there and we just get just desperate and we give up on it all. I'm, I'm, I've built on this broken thing, right? The good news is, is that's not the end of the story. The end of the story is that God is a new beginning for you every day. And so into that darkness you might have received the light of the new beginning of God. And as you look in the world around you and you see people that are broken and have built on faulty foundations, rather than look at them with contempt or annoyance, why not shine that wombful mercy of God to them from your own heart? Wouldn't that change things? If Christians were known as people that, yeah, we're messed up at times, but we really rely on this God who is so kind to us, it's unbelievable, and we offer that to you as well. Not being known for what we're necessarily against, but what we're for. We're for the mercy and love of God, and that changes everything. And so, in the beginning of the end, there's still a hope of a new beginning. And may you on this Sabbath, a day that we celebrate the gift of God, where he builds everything and gives it to us when we've done nothing to earn it, may you receive that mercy of God today in your hearts. May you rest on that. May you build on that. And in your fear, in your loss, your very real fear, your very real loss, things that you don't know how to handle, you don't know how you're gonna meet the bills, you don't know how you're gonna like get through this loneliness or this, this loss or whatever it is, that you would wait on the Lord and rest and see the salvation of a God who would do anything for you. May the beginning of your end be the new beginning of a God who's wombful towards you. God, we thank you that you don't give up God, you would chase us to your very death, to the gates of hell and beyond to bring us back to new life. And God, we pray that your mercy would, would define our stories, that our stories that are full of selfishness, selfishness and brokenness and, and pride and arrogance and all the things that just really mess life up, God, that each one of our stories are intertwined with many of those things. That God, a new theme would be woven into our story, a new foundation would be put under a breaking house, God the foundation of your love and your mercy for us. And may this church, may Fletcher Seventh-day Adventist Church, may each one of our lives individually and as a community, God, be defined by that mercy you give us every day and that we turn around and we give to each other in this world in return. God, we love you because you first loved us. May that love define us. May that love transcend us and remake us into a new beginning. We ask this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. We trust your relationship with God has been strengthened from what you have heard today. Please visit our website at www.fletchersda.org. May God give you His peace and joy.